Hello, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me, but I guess you can hear me. Um, I just would like to say a very um, warm welcome to everyone. And um, I hope you noticed we already started recording our session today. Um, yes, and I will, we will have an English and German speaking um, guest today. So I will switch in between, between German and English and, and, and yeah, while I'm talking and, and doing the welcome. Um, I'm not sure if we should wait a little moment more. Uh, maybe somebody could give me a sign. Ah, cool. <laughs> okay, now I see you a bit more. So maybe first of all, maybe I can um, shortly introduce you to to the people who will be talking today. So um, if you don't mind, maybe I can welcome Jan van Hesek and Grit Jürgensen. I think you're already here. Maybe if you if you don't mind, you could switch on your camera and we could see you for a short moment. Ah, there you are. Okay, now I see you. <laughs> Sorry for not reacting. Nice to see you. Welcome. The good you made it. Very happy to. And yes, I also see Lisa Marie Tander from Micropole. Maybe you also uh, there already. So, so now everybody can see our guests and speakers today. Um, and uh, I quickly switch to German. So, also, herzlich willkommen und einen wunderschönen guten Abend zu unserem zweiten städtebaulichen Kolloquium in diesem Semester. Und wie Sie und ihr wahrscheinlich gerade festgestellt habt, es ist also eine deutsch-englische Veranstaltung. Wir werden Vorträge auf Deutsch und auf Englisch haben. Bei dem englischen Vortrag haben wir oder werden wir das ausprobieren, werden wir eine, äh, die Live-Untertitel äh, sozusagen zum Englischen einfach dazu schalten, sodass wir hoffen, dass es auch gut zu verstehen ist. Ähm, aber soweit ich weiß, können Brit Jürgensen und auch Jan kann ein bisschen Deutsch. Das heißt, Fragen, Diskussionen nachher, wenn ihr eine Frage auf dem Chat auf Deutsch stellen wollt, ist das kein Problem. Wir kriegen das auf jeden Fall übersetzt und transportiert. So, das sollte kein Problem sein. Vielleicht noch eine kleine ähm, Info zum Ablauf. Wir werden jetzt erst den Vortrag von Jan van Hesek und Fred Jürgensen haben zu Homebeck, ähm, ein Projekt in Liverpool äh, in, in England, das auch schon ziemlich lange läuft, seit 2012. Und ich bin ganz gespannt. Ich habe, glaube ich, zum ersten Mal vielleicht 2014 oder so von dem Projekt gehört. Und jedes Mal, wenn ich wieder davon gehört habe, war das äh, in einem anderen Stadion. Und diese Grundsatzfrage, die wir haben, wer wie wer, wann und wie, kann man, glaube ich, an dem Projekt auch noch mal sehr deutlich äh, nachvollziehen, sozusagen, wer, wann und wie in Stadtentwicklungsprozesse eingebunden ist, wer die Stadt wie entwickeln kann und wie man sozusagen vielleicht auch eine Gegenmacht entwickeln kann, um solche vielleicht auch schon eigentlich vorgeschriebenen Prozesse ähm, zu verändern. Und dann haben wir als zweites Projekt, werden wir sozusagen wie so also eine Projektreply ähm, von Lisa Mar Marie Zander hören und zwar von, der Projekt, von dem Projekt Mikropol, das ist in Hamburg. Ähm, ich viel verraten, es ist als Kern, ist es sozusagen, oder als Ort, ist es ein ehemaliges öffentliches Toilettenhaus in der Mitte von ähm, einer großen Kreuzungsstraße, wo die Initiative auch seit 2019, Lisa, 19? Ja, so grob, also als Kreis ist man nochmal richtig, äh, eben sozusagen auch zeigt, wie eigentlich Stadt oder wie man eigentlich auch gesellschaftlich, aus der Zivilgesellschaft heraus Orte entwickeln kann. Und dann freue ich mich auch ganz besonders, haben wir Florian Heinkel hier von der Hafeninitiative Dortmund. Er hat auch hier in Dortmund Raumplanung studiert, lebt jetzt in Köln, ist auch bei der Kommunenzeitschrift dabei ähm, und wird uns eben dann sozusagen auch nochmal Einblicke in die Arbeit und den Stand der Hafeninitiative Dortmund geben. Und heute auch der Versuch sozusagen, diese große Diskussion zwischen Liverpool, Hamburg und Dortmund äh, zu haben und zu sehen, wie sich vielleicht verschiedene Praxen oder auch unsere ich mal, Stadtentwicklungspraxen überschneiden, was man vielleicht voneinander lernen kann. Ähm, ja, und da so ein bisschen Einblicke auch immer in die lokalen Prozesse zu bekommen. Das ist auch heute, heute auch wieder Inhalt sein. Wir werden auch am Ende, wenn wir diskutieren, gibt's auch, haben wir auch vorbereitet, gibt, äh, machen wir so ein bisschen Interaktion, damit wir jetzt heute nicht nur hier sitzen und zuhören müssen, äh, mit einer kleinen Mentimeter-Umfrage, aber das kündige ich dann nochmal an, das können wir dann auch live sehen. So viel vielleicht erstmal zu meinem Part auf Deutsch. Ähm, genau. Und dann 
gehe ich wieder rüber auf Englisch. <laughs> so I switch back to English because I guess uh, you're, you're, um, you will speak in English, John and, and Ritz, right? So, and as I mentioned before, we do have, um, we will have uh, not translation, but we will have, um, oh my God, an English underline uh, with you. So it's going to be automatically from Zoom. So I guess that's a little bit easier to understand. Um, and yes, we will actually start right now. I just would like to introduce you a bit. So Jan is an artist. Um, and sorry, I just maybe read your, your CV very shortly. So who facilitates uh, the creation of dynamic and diverse diversified public spaces in order to radicalize the local. I think that's also something we can see with the project today. Um, and her long scale community embedded project questions arts autonomy by combining performative action, discussions, and other forms of organizing and pedagogy to assist communities to take control of their own futures. And this is maybe also something uh, we're maybe gonna learn about today. Um, and I really like also the the point of view, we've, because we are all, or most of us here are from background from urban planning and this switches um, the focus to to the emancipative work from communities. So I think that might be um, very interesting. Um, like your work um, has been featured in numerous books and publications worldwide. So, uh, and you've been part of the Biennale in Liverpool. This is also where this project um, started. And also by Shanghai and Venice, you've been a Buck Fellow, the IK Fellow, right? And also um, the Fellow of Keith uh, Sharing Fellow in Art and Activism at Bard College. And you received in 2012 the Curry Stone Prize for Social Design Pioneers. So maybe I leave it with that, but you're welcome to add everything you would like to do to yourself. Okay, and I would also like to introduce Brit, Brit Jürgensen. So you two work together at, at the Homebreak project. And it's the first time I see you, so I'm very, very happy to get to know you. And um, you are an um, activist, performance artist, and creative facilitator working within social movements, reclaiming common ownership of housing, land, and energy. So also like right then um, object, actually. Um, you live down the road from home base in Liverpool, and you have played an integral role in developing both the community and um, the land trust, the community land trust and bakery cooperative. So you're, I guess you're gonna learn a lot of insights from you today. And for home base TLT, the community land trust, I believe, yeah, I'm gonna explain that later maybe, um, you have facilitated participatory art design and planning processes, developed comms and campaigning strategies, and now um, you are, your task is to bring the investment together for a new scheme. So you're probably gonna tell us a little bit more about that as well. Okay, so very interesting. And then I will switch to you actually. So you are welcome to share the screen and um, I'm gonna sit back and listen to you. Thank you, Renee. Can you just um, say if you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you quite well. Mm -hmm. Good. And can you hear me as well? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Great. Um, um, einen schönen guten Abend. Um, wir fangen einfach mal auf Deutsch an und dann gehen wir ins Englische, weil es wir es, weil Jean, auch Jeanne spricht genug Deutsch, um euch zu verstehen. Um, aber uh, da wir über die Arbeit meistens auf um, Englisch sprechen, ist das einfacher. Aber wir sprechen langsam und jederzeit wird da einfach Fragen stellen und auch gerne auf Deutsch. Um, mein Internet ist heute etwas um, temperamentvoll. Um, bitte einfach sagen, wenn um, man es nicht hören kann, aber es ist ein Problem. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yes, welcome. Very, very glad to be invited. My name is Britt. And I'm Jeanne. <laughs> and uh, I, I have And um, we're I... here to... Sorry, Britt. Is that ahead. again, Jeanne? I said I have, <laughs> I have the PowerPoint, so I probably determine the speed, but Britt will, I think, do more, most of the talking. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jana has the power over the PowerPoint. So um, um, uh, we're going to talk about a home baked. Uh, um, we are um, based in Liverpool. 
and um, we're going to tell you a little bit about the context of where we work so that you understand what we do in a bit of more of a situated form and you know why we do things uh, and then we're going to talk a bit about what we do how we do that and um, a little bit about our new scheme and future plans so um Welcome to our uh, uh, neighbourhood uh, in a bird's eye view from uh, 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 around the time when we actually started. It looks quite different today. Um, we are in Anfield, which many of you probably know um, because it's the home to one of the most famous football clubs in the world, Liverpool Football Club. And when you see that little um, red rectangle, across from the football club that is the um i guess the home base of home baked um we are um on the high street so you can probably see there naturally the high street how it how it sort of travels through and right past the um football club um this neighborhood is about 10 minutes from the city center and uh, uh as you can probably also see it is, or it used to be at least, uh, a very traditional British terraces, mostly built end of the 19th and beginning of the um, 20th century. And um, it would have been built for and partly also by um, people that worked on the docks in Liverpool. So Liverpool at the time um, had its main industry in, 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 in the docks, dock working. And uh, um, this would have been a actually blue and white collar mixed um, working class community. Um, it looks a little bit different now, but we'll, um, um, Jana, can you go to the next slide? I, I always like to so show that because that gives you a bit of an, an understanding where one um, of the biggest tourist attractions in Liverpool, probably the biggest just after the Beatles. And uh, we have about 60,000 people from all over the world walk down our high street for up to 30 days a year, of course, on match day, which is what you see here, but also off match day, people coming to visit, to do stadium tours and so on. This club was built alongside this neighborhood, so it has always been situated, as you can see here. And it's a really surprising kind of when people come and visit not many places, you can find a, a football club where the houses basically um, are, are close enough to that you could, at the time, at the time, the, the players would have gotten changed, you know, in somebody's back room and then walked straight into the club. Not today anymore at all. Um, we are, of course, also very favoured uh, 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 as Germans at the moment in the neighbourhood because of the, uh, the uh, uh, current coach we have. So, um, um, despite all of that, we are also one of the most deprived areas in the country, with many families dependent on benefits, often even when they are in work, high levels of poverty, and therefore also some of the highest levels of fuel poverty in the country. So people can't afford to heat their homes in the winter. These are of course statistics, but um, you know, we always say we don't really like the word deprived. We are actually um, an area that is also full of creativity and a long tradition of mutual support. Next slide. And what you see here basically, so in these pictures of um, what we call tinned up, closed up um, um, terraces. And Jana, if you go to the next one, thank you, that's fine. Um, this um, area has been, I mean, in decline really, like Liverpool since the docks um, closed, but um, so since the 70s, 80s, but then um, since um, 2010, we've been subject to some really problematic top-down regeneration schemes, so nationally funded and locally implemented uh, 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 regeneration schemes that were really angled at um, what they called even market renewal, 
So um, they were they were angled at, uh, um, I guess, lifting up the uh, market value of housing in the area. So uh, 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 people's uh, people were got a like a compulsory purchase order. Were told they would be compulsory purchased if they didn't sell. So most people sold for a price that they couldn't afford to then buy a new home for. Um, most of those houses got demolished as a mass demolish uh, demolishing program, and then you see the new houses built, which unfortunately um, uh, were. Um, lower quality of what um, the old housing stock was and, and could be built originally. And it displaced many people, it kind of dispersed our community. And um, Sean, I don't know, do you want to um, just say something to that image? Because you often use it and I think um, you can talk to that really well. Yeah, and I think what Bridge just said is that the the the, the value uh, of of the area, like this, is an image that that we show, which is about the bricks. So one of the things is that the bricks of which the Victorian houses were built were then, uh, when they were demolished, were like scraped clean, and were packaged in pallets to send to London and to Manchester to actually create this nice like sort of walls uh, in the in in the new lofts uh, that were uh, being built there and um, with uh, Homebake we have a saying that these bricks were sold for one pound each brick so you can imagine if you demolish a whole area how much value is actually shipped out of the area and the bricks that were used to build the new houses back were worth like 30 pence so even there, like sort of say the materiality of the area and the value of the area was sort of like, um, was sort of like uh, used almost against the community. And I think this is, uh, this is, this is sort of interesting. Uh, uh, what for home big become also an interesting thing is like, how can we not only, um, you know, um, work with community values, but also retain some of these values back for the community. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the next slide, um, uh, you can have a, there's a, a, um, a view on the high street, which, um, you know, uh, uh, that high street has been in decline again, you know, since, since the 80s. But again, I think a, a, a really interesting, um, interesting sad development over time was that we got to a time where when you see here on the second picture, where it was actually more viable to um, open shops, so to rent a shop space and only open on match days, so only on those 20 to 30 days a year. Uh, uh, and, and at all other times, it was shuttered, closed. Um, so we had very little local provision and a lot of takeaway food, or takeaways as we call them. And um, if you uh, uh, go to the next slide, Jana, then you can see one of the, our last family businesses that was catering to uh, people, local people every day with actual products that people need um, was uh, uh, Mitchell's Bakery, which is also the base um, um, that we now operate from. And what you can see here on the right is actually Mrs. Mitchell, um, they um, uh, 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 they worked and ran that bakery, I think, from about the 50s, but it was custom built, you know, it was, it was always a bakery since about 1903. Uh, uh, they they were running this business um, since until 2010, when they were told that, that this entire block was also going to be demolished and um, that they would be compensated if they sold, uh, uh, which, you know, they then closed down shop to then not be compensated for like I think it was like nearly like another eight years or something um uh and if we just go to the next slide and then I will um, pass on to Jean so um we often use this image um because uh, these kind of signs were all over our neighborhood you know a brighter Anfield is coming um and these signs were around for about 
20 years, up to 20 years. So there's a lot of waiting here. There's a lot of waiting involved. And, and at the time that Jana started working in the, in the area, you know, like it was just after the bubble had burst in 2008, the uh, developer retreated um, and our neighborhood was left in a, you know, it looked a bit like a battlefield, like houses tinned up, um, some demolished, some built new. And one of our co-founders, Angela, often um, in the beginning, she often said, you know, we are sick of waiting. Um, and I think she really meant it. it's, it's, a, it's a sense of being physically sick. It's a sense of being, um, you know, of being disempowered and of just waiting for something to happen to you. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think that that sort of like was 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 for me very interesting that she she said that that she was sick of sick of the waiting that she talked about this like embodied uh, condition this this embodied condition of really not feeling well about it and also. Um, a thing that she brought forward was like that a lot of promises have been broken. A lot of things had been promised to the, the area that at some point in the future, a brighter Enfield is coming, as it said. But nobody said when uh, that would be happening and if it at all would be a bright future and how that would be happening and what kind of part it would take in. And I think what for me became very important is to shift actually very simply this idea from stop waiting, start making. So how can we start making again together uh, an idea about what a bright end field might look like? How can we work together to take matters into our hands in order to create uh, a future uh, that can hold our uh, uh, desires in common, but that can also uh, hold the promises that we bring to each other and uh, to the neighborhood. And I think that was a very important You just unmuted yourself, John. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, I also have a bad cold, so I'm constantly afraid that I will cough into your uh, into your conference. Uh, so here you see uh, the bakery, and and you see also the block the bakery is part of, because during my initial research and my initial working uh, in uh, in the area. Um, we spoke to a lot of people and different community centers because what quite often happens is that the developer, in order to get the tender for this for 10 years or for 10 years to come, of course, had to invest money into the community. And then suddenly there are these bright community centers popping up uh, that are only maybe resourced for so long uh, as there's money and at some point. So I had some meetings in community centers where I also met Angela, but I think it's always very important for the practice to what I call set up camp to create an independent working space from which we can not only start ideating and talking, but also start making. And when the Mitchell's Bakery closed, I had there my cups and coffees and my, my, little, my little cakes and sandwiches. When I was doing the, the, the work in the area, I, I, I approached the Mitchell if we could actually rent their space uh, uh, in order to use it as a, as a, as a working place. And I think this was sort of a very important moment. Not only did we have a place on the high street to meet, but whenever we were meeting um, and discussing about what this, this, this making could mean, uh, people were also dropping in uh, and asking if we would still sell bread, still sell cake. And I think what you quite often see in these discussions about what does it mean to live well, that for a lot of people who are super frustrated about the housing and the housing situation and didn't feel sometimes they even wanted to re-engage with it, suddenly talking about bread and talking about cakes sort of like created new interests. So you could say that it was not longer only about shelter, but also about sustenance, uh, which sort of like lured uh, the people in. So here you see some pictures from the first design processes. What does it mean to live well? Does this only mean nice houses? But how do we deal also with fuel poverty, with, uh, with good food on the table, with affordable jobs? What does it mean to create a thriving community? And here you see some pictures from the early day sketches and working with uh, carton paneling uh, about like, okay, what is actually a house? 
what what would your house look like? Could we do something with the existing two ups to down? Do you always have to demolish? Can we retrofit? Uh, and so on and so on. Brit? Yeah, give me a second. Um, yeah, and here you actually see um, the first um, baking. So this would be probably around the time um, that I joined. I was living down the road, so I joined alongside many other many different people who came to join this process for very different reasons but um uh, 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 i guess all with a very similar aim which was to somehow um make the place better you know in that very simple way making it better and um and uh, we we started baking you know life on site and we um uh, and we started just um, bringing out uh, cakes. People were cake baking cakes at home, bringing them to the bakery, then selling on match day. Uh, uh, and so we slowly started to, you know, build capacity. None of us actually had any, I, I, to be honest, I actually, I've never become a very good baker, but you know, people, people came in with different interests and they started to actually train and learn and become better. Uh, and actually some of them become proper master master bakers and uh um jean do you want to take on on the uh, over on the story yeah and i think this is something that that sort of was uh important to tell because when we were having our meetings there talking about housing and people started to bring cakes i think the discussion also shifted from talking about housing to talking about sustenance and jobs and living well and what was needed it for it and for community building and as brit said people were bringing cakes and then, you know, first offering it for people to join the conversation, but then also starting to sell it on match day. So they started to actually do something what I call modeling skill one to one. I mean, the ovens that were in the bakery were not longer suitable for today's uh, um, process. So uh, people baked at home, but started to sell uh, on site and started to slowly do up. Uh, the bakery uh, and sort of started to actually, in Dutch you would say almost play bakery, uh, but this pre-configuration or this modeling scale one-to-one -one, I think is something that was very important. And also by doing this, it was about like almost collectively rehearsing another narrative, another history or history about the area, because a lot of the planning that was done on the area was also done with a narrative that this area was in decline. There was a lot of unemployment. There was a lot of bad behavior. So it goes always with a narrative of like being in decline. It never talks about the pride there is, about the skills there is, about the things. So while we were scheming and, and prefiguring, people also started to become more, uh, uh, yeah, more vocal about what they wanted and what they need. And then of course, baking also leads to very good quotes, rise up and feel like though we rise, you know? So we're, you know, it started to, to do, and here you see pictures of a first bake off for national TV, where people brought their home baked products. And then we had an official ju jury from uh, TV to uh, basically uh, judge the home baked products, home baked uh, products, literally in this case, home baked products. And, uh, and that sort of became part of us uh, or the bakery telling their own story about what they uh, thought about the neighborhood. And this led to a lot of activities, not only all kind of programming, but also to a real uh, home bake tour. And bit telling this story, also the story started spreading to the New York Times even uh, about this desire for uh, a town's rebirth. Uh, mm. Great. Yeah, and you know, this is a piece of, so this is where we used some really performance Work. This was part of the Liverpool Biennial. Biennial. It was a. It was a, a performed site-specific tour in a minibus, and people just went on the minibus and they learned about the neighbourhood. They had a. a they had a, 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 a sort of comedic couple who were, you know, the the uh, the tour guide and his uncle who was driving the van, and then they were slowly, slowly being introduced to the uh, the the situation and the politics in the area. With a lot of humor, but then also, of course, with uh, you know, with people's personal stories. So entering people's homes, talking over the fence, uh, 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 and and starting to learn um, 
what was happening then ending at the bakery and really um, starting a conversation because of course as soon as you used to have people come into the area you start having can you can actually and, and tell that story and and own that story yourself you can start having a conversation about this situation in a much more um it, 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 with a lot more agency um and um, if we go to the next uh, uh, slide, you know, we then uh, started to um, um, refurbish the bakery. And at the time, actually, um, um, there was two groups forming, one to really do more of the sort of being the, uh, the landlord and the developing, development company um, uh, doing the refurbishment and maybe at some point going towards collective ownership of the assets. And then the other one was a bakery cooperative. So a group of people developing that as a functioning business. And um, uh, this is actually from one of our really, um, our refurbs just before we opened the bakery in 2013, again, for the public. And then we actually had a lot of money at that time. Uh, uh, or we had like you know we had funding funding lined up but we weren't able to take that funding because by that point uh, um, demolition had taken root again and we were told that we were going to be demolished and so the community brought together you know a lot of energy and we um, used some arts funding to um, to refurbish to do a quick refurbish and to just say you know we're here um if you go to the next slide john and when we're here to stay so we're just going to open and and let's see what happens um, um and this was all all when we were still having a demolition order on the building <laughs> that uh so if i say like we played bakery or we modeled skill to one then this was not just a one time off we actually just started to run the visioning amidst uh, the, the, the demolition machines, uh, actually almost at the back of our building. Yeah. Yeah, and um, um, we, often, we often use that story, although it's a long time ago now, because it is really important for us. This has always been the way of kind of showing our value is by just manifesting the thing that we do. And, and, and so people can actually experience it rather than it being a plan, right? So this is about um, embodied experience. And, and so in that way, the bakery was the embodied experience of what might just be possible on IR High Street. Um, um, I'm gonna speed us up a bit because I know we, you know, we don't wanna run over time. So um, brick by brick and loaf by loaf. So we, as I said, we went into two organizations and um, in a way we, we started, you know, we started with the bakery building as our first um, monument, as our first site. And uh, we fully refurbished the bakery and obviously opened it as a, as a business, which today is um, uh, um, makes a profit, is, is, um, is successful, it's you know, difficult during uh, COVID times, of course, um, um, uh, but offers uh, good jobs for people locally and obviously a place to meet and to buy fresh food at uh, good prices. So this is not a bushy, not a, this is not a sourdough chic <laughs> bakery. This is a down to earth bakery that also sells a lot of pies on match days to, um, to, to, uh, to our fans. And at the top, we developed uh, uh, our first flat um, for people. Uh, living there and uh, we'll show you a couple of pictures maybe here so here you see uh, you know uh, our team making um, pies this is where this business is run as a community business so it is actually collectively owned by its members and uh, uh, you can see here how busy it gets uh, on a March day you can see some of the food and then if we go to the next slides Jeanne uh, just to get a sense of what the building was like um, and we went through a, a process of um, building and also learning. So we had some um, trainees on site who worked with us um, and volunteers came in to, to teach certain skills. And then this is a, a finished picture of our first flat, which now is rented out and has been for, we finished that in 2016. Um, and uh, 
I would say, you know, that was a, it was a really hard work because of course, when we started, we didn't know anything, you know, about, about running businesses, about, well, some of us did, but you know, there's a very different skills in the room and, uh, and a lot of the, a lot of the graft, I guess, of getting these kind of organizations up on the, on the road is really just, um, it's building people's capacity it's um, finding out where the where the desires and passions lie. It's um, learning how to hold a good job. It's um, learning how to be on a board. All of these um, skills that come with developing and holding and making sustainable these kind of um, community led organizations. The other organization that um, is more like the community developer, developer and the landlord is a community land trust, which is again, it's a, it's a, um, we are organized in a member owned collective. So everybody who's local or has a local connection can become a member, um, just pay a pound. And then uh, it's a democratically owned and run organization with this smaller, but actually now quite large board going forward. And what you see here is um, basically us, then going from the uh, from the bakery building, same principle, same idea of uh, a mixed mixed uh, uh, business and uh, living space, and uh, scaling that up. Um, we called it build your own high street, um, and uh, um, particularly looking at the entire the wider block, and also the uh, disused public green space. Uh, 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 in the back of, uh, of our building. And um, we do that, I'll just talk a tiny bit about how we work today. So we often, you know, we, we do a lot of the planning and designing um, together. We, you know, we're, we, we, are, we are a developer, but for us, this goes way beyond the brick and mortar, way beyond the housing. Uh, um, it's about developing ourselves and developing our community. So, um, you know, we work in very much on the basis of what uh, Jana showed in the beginning. We do uh, uh, participatory planning and uh, design workshops um, in, in which people um, actually um, deal with all aspects of um, these plans. So also the budgets available, what might be possible within the realm of reality. Um, um, always, of course, also doing some blue sky thinking. Um, if you go to the next one, Jana, and um, something that for us is really important to continue is the same thing that Jana spoke about, about the bakery. I would say is like the embodied experience of something like, um, I would say that in spaces like ours where things have been difficult, for a long time um, and things have been done to people, it can sometimes be difficult to imagine, um, to imagine potential, to, to imagine something good. So it's quite important to actually um, build it and experience it, it. And in that time, in that kind of way, we do um, meanwhile use, but we do meanwhile use always as a or meanwhile development as a way of um, being able to imagine something to then find um, the actual more sustainable long-term solution. And we always talk about owning that together um, to protect it from um, gentrification. That's of course a really wide um, hope, you know, because um, we, are, we are all stuck in this um, system. Um, so we are also agents of, of gentrification while we do this. Um, you, you can see here, for example, this is our disused um, um, ground in the background. And then if you go to the next uh, uh, um, slide, you know, many of you will know this kind of work. So we do um, meanwhile um, structures or, uh, and then if you go to the next slide, we do a whole program of events of imagining how we could use these kind of spaces. Uh, uh, together and while we do that of course also having as much fun as we can and um, 
Equally, we took over one of the houses on our block in order to for people to really do the planning and the thinking in the spaces that they're thinking for and also bringing more people on site and, um, you know, uh, having arts, arts exhibitions and ways of, of activating space. And out of that um, kind of process, then, for example, grew uh, another business for us, which is a, is a um, female Mm, a growing education and uh, and and brewing company, um, which really grew out of these uh, uh, processes. So now there's home baked and homegrown. And um, Jana, I think you might want to say a couple of words about the artist DNA, and then I'll just finish talking about the scheme. Yeah, I mean, I think what Brett, Britt uh, was just saying, and I think that is important, we just re recently did even an, a small symposium uh, around it, where we always said like, and Renee, you said like, okay, this project comes from art or arts involved, and we always say that we have arts in, in our DNA, that we always work uh, like ways of working collectively at imagining our futures in different forms by writing them, by drawing them, by singing them, by projecting them, but something that we've been doing collectively. Uh, and I think we use many forms of uh, arts uh, uh, for that, but also taking into account that this is a collective learning process and that within all of our peoples involved in, 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 in home-baked uh, uh, history, there's always been forms of storytelling, forms of giving image to the situation uh, that helped uh, us not only move forward. So I would say that art is in our DNA and not something that is extra or next to it, but that is actually propels uh, our collective learning and our collective unlearning. <laughs> and do you want to sort of move on to the this is just some of the uh, 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 people involved and the artists involved. And yeah, because that's what people always are. Are you the artist? And then I, I was <laughs> like, okay, let's just let's just bring everybody from home big that we know have some kind of uh, art uh, practice, uh, more or less. So uh, here you go. These are this is the art in home big. <laughs> from DJs to storytellers to painters to brewers to entertainers to uh, uh, textile designers to photographers to poets, uh, as you can see. Uh, mm -hmm. And also that they are painter pie maker or photographer baker or poet and activist. So like, as I said, like art is not an add-on, it's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm just going to take a tiny bit of time to talk about the scheme. So out of this process of building our high street or imagining our high street, we have uh, uh, developed a, a scheme for um, the adjacent houses. I should probably say, and we didn't say that, like opening the bakery meant that we saved it from demolition like we were able to prove the value and make a point that this maybe this building should stay and kind of on the back of that we developed a relationship with the council who own this entire terrace and still a lot of land that they bought off um, people that is now out for investment. So uh, um, uh, we were then also at some point finally able to retain the rest of the terrace and cre create a scheme uh, of retention and transformation for that terrace. Uh, so it's an alternative to demolition. It's uh, uh, born out of the need to um, for better energy efficiencies. Um, uh, obviously the desire to provide good quality housing at an affordable price and the, the feeling of being safe to, in the house that you live in. Um, and then extending the, the commercial offer and uh, um, providing spaces for encounter and learning, um, which our design team basically signed up in the sentence, we want the buzz back. We want the buzzing feeling back. And uh, it's a mixed use scheme. So live, work and play with a little market scale space on the side and the green space in the back. Um, we developed it in a participatory design and planning process with Herbert, who are a Manchester based um, architecture uh, office who specialize in participatory uh, um, 
practice and also very much in retrofit. Um, our architect is probably, and when we talk about retrofit for the, for you, this is about um, um, improving the energy efficiency of existing homes. Um, is how this is called in English, and uh, and and our architect is actually one of the leading experts in the country. Her name is uh, Marianne Heaslip. And uh, then we went through a whole process with people locally. So we get involved about 20 core people in our team who are local residents that want to be involved in members. And then we go through a process of um, planning, but also learning, of course, about design and about energy efficiency and so on. Um, and then they do create a design that is then put out to um, a, a public sort of more consultation process with people giving their feedback from the wider community. And you can see here that it was really important to retain the traditional front inches and then become much more modern around the back. Uh, it has a fabric first retrofit with a focus on comfort and health. Um, it, and then the bakery building extend, uh, is, is extended for, for, for um, training facilities. And then we have a second community business homegrown collective who are moving in on the other end. And we have a small business unit in one of the front rooms that we can use for um, our business incubation development. And if you go to the next slide, Jana, uh, you can just have a little overlook about the, the way that we sort of transformed and changed the, 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 uh, the, the traditional sort of three bedroom. So we kept a couple of the traditional three bed houses um, for families, but there's a lot of desire for two bed flats, for example. So we have, uh, uh, several of those. We also have an accessible ground flat and then we have a one, one bedroom flat. All of them have outdoor space. All of them have above average size. So it's really, it was so much about quality for people. Like what do we deserve? How um, could we live? And um, if you go to the, the next one, then here you have the commercial units. So this is extending into what we're thinking around really building our high street. And if you go back one, um, you, uh, um, it's fine, don't worry about it. Um, uh, we, we are extending um, a little bit of the commercial offer as we can in like what is clearly a domestic space. <laughs> um, um, and this will have attached to it a uh, 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 sort of business development program in the way that we do business development um which is very person person centered and around people's ideas um into sustainability and then the uh um what was really important for for our group was to um uh, uh um insulate the houses with a sort of what we call a fabric first approach that reduces the space heating demand by 80 percent um um, so even though we are moving from gas to uh, air source heat technology, um, you know, we're, we're still reducing people's fuel bills by 50% and carbon emissions by about 70%. And that um, is really setting an example for this kind of work. It's, um, it's, it's quite innovative and really quite revolutionary to do that in an area, uh, um, in a low -com income area like ours. Uh, and um, it was always really important in the process to um, talk, people talk a lot about the health and the comfort and the lower bills that come um, with that, uh, and not the carbon emissions. That is something that we then discussed on top of that. But in a way, we start with the co-benefits um, uh, uh, of going towards zero carbon. And um, in this process, of course, this brought an immense amount of upskilling locally. So we can now talk confidently about carbon emissions, about how to go to zero, about how to retrofit our homes and so on. And uh, we are developing, we're, well, we are at the moment in the process of um, land disposal questions and all of that, but we will be starting on site next year in April after lots of delays through COVID it and it's delivered by a development partner who are building this for us and then we are buying the entire block back so it will in the end be in full community ownership with the homes and the businesses for rent okay Shana, last slide <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I, I just had this uh, financial projection yeah. appendix uh, one uh, up uh, because like, uh, of course, we have to do a lot of like scheming and financial um, financial thinking around it. Um, and if I say we, then uh, as Brit say, like we is a group of people who for many years now are been working together, but it's still a steep learning curve for all of us involved because we're talking about a scheme now of 1.9 million pounds. Uh, for most people, uh, that's a dazzling amount of money and also a dazzling amount of responsibility to take that on. So to understand uh, what it means to bring this money together to create a scheme, but also to understand it together uh, and to learn together across like, you know, class, across learning uh, skills is still a steep learning curve and it's still full of political uncertainties because the council is always with us and not with us still up today we're no longer having a demolition order uh, on it but we still also don't have 100 percent land clearance yet so it is still an ongoing uh, struggle and i think it sort of started with something very simple uh, as we say it like uh because we've been many times offered by the council, like, okay, you maybe can just open a bakery in the other side uh, of uh, the, uh, how I say it, on, on the other side of uh, the, the club, uh, the stadium uh, in the new build, or you maybe you could do this or that, or maybe you could just, you know, think of something different, or you could do this or that, or try to just sort of move home baked into their thinking and to their scheme. And I think one of the things that we, for a very long time said, we do not want a piece of the pie. We want a whole effing bakery. And I think this is important to say, we just do not want to participate in one part of your bright future for Anfield that's coming. We do want to be the bright future of Anfield. Thank you. Mm -hmm.